In the horror world, if somebody says, your film made me physically ill, yeah. it's the only genre where that's a compliment. I'm here talking with the writer, the director, the executive producer, the maker of The Invisible Man, Mr. Lee Wanell. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining me. Now, the film, mate, it's terrifying, <laughs> like, good, legitimately good. <laughs> terrifying. Um, I, I suffer from trypophobia. Oh, um, okay, I know that, yeah. Yeah, the, the fear of uneven dots and, yeah. you know, things. <laughs> so, yeah, this is a film that uh, really messed with me. So, uh, yes, thanks. okay, really you're welcome. Appreciate. Yeah, that's a compliment. In the horror world, if somebody says, your film made me physically ill, yeah. it's the only genre where that's a compliment. <laughs> Like if I if I do a musical and somebody says oh, it made me ill, I I I would be quite upset. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I'm actually happy to hear yeah, that no, you were no. disturbed beyond belief. Where do you start with a film like this? Because we've seen the Invisible Man, or we haven't seen the Invisible Man <laughs> on screen multiple times, whether it be TV or or whatever. Where do you start? What's your kind of key starting point? With this particular film, um, the first starting point was making it modern modernising this character. This is a character with a lot of cultural baggage and a history, and I just wanted to cut that cord. Um, in a respectful way, I actually think in a strange way, cutting the cord to the past is the most respectful thing you could do to the, to the original H.G. Wells character because you are bringing it to a modern audience in a way that they can be scared by it in the same way that people, you know, 80 years ago were scared, you know? You know what I mean? Like, it has to be recontextualized for modern audiences. Um, I didn't want to make anything retro, anything gothic. I wanted to make something that was just completely cold and clinical and modern and very grounded, um, which is a difficult task when you're talking about a film titled The Invisible Man. How do you make it grounded and real? and I realised that tech would be my way in. So that was the first thing I thought. And the second thing I thought was just um, to point the camera at empty rooms. I wanted, to, I wanted to point the camera down empty corridors and make the audience suspicious of every corner of the frame. I wanted them scanning the entire screen, yeah. looking for evidence of somebody. Yeah. And uh, that's what I tried to do, yeah. And it's what you do do so well. Like the the film is very clever at using negative space, mm. like empty space in the frame. You know things behind mm -hmm. the the look of where the characters are looking. Mm -hmm. and you kind of constantly find yourself thinking, "What am I looking at? What am I looking that's for?" That's great to hear. <laughs> yeah, no, it works super well. Now, was that, that that's something great to hear. you wanted, or was that something that you were talking to your uh, DOP on, uh, Stefan? Or it was. It was. It was something when I was <clears throat> when I was writing the screenplay. Um, the first thing I do is try to think, well, what can I offer that's unique? Like, you know, I've done a lot of horror films before. What am I going to do that's differently? Because I don't want to tread over the same ground. And so one of the things I decided was to make the camera a character in the film so that the camera had a mind of its own. It would scan the room. And, and uh, when I finally finished the script and we went into pre-production, I sat down with Stefan Ducio and said, I told him all this, you know, about what I wanted to do. And we had many conversations about it. So it's a really long conversation that builds to you sitting in a dark room for a couple of hours watching it. And then you get hit with all these decisions that have been made over the course of a year really quickly. And, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's definitely a lot of planning for a quick execution, you know, in the eyes of the audience anyway. It is, but it doesn't feel like it's a rushed thing at all. It feels right, like it, right, it builds right. very, very carefully to a point where you are you are on the edge of your seat because that empty space is going to hit me or it's going to do something. Right. And, and I, I think it's it, you're right. You kept make the character uh, the camera a character, and you step into that. Uh, it, it's a very, very right. in intelligent, smart piece of filmmaking, so congratulations. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, we put a lot of work into it. Every frame of the film represents the work of hundreds of people, so, yeah. um, you know, for you to say it's working is great. Yeah, well, you can tell. So, I guess you could call the film, if you wanted to not call it The Invisible Man, you could call it right. Gaslighting, the movie. Right, right. Um, what research did you do into abuse? And Because, like, it's it's a pretty heavy topic, but... To me, that's what the film felt like. This is this is an exploration of mental mm -hmm. and emotional abuse. Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, once I started writing the story and mapping it out, it felt like that was the direction the story wanted to go in. 
And so one of the important things when I'm writing a script is research. You know, any screenwriting book will tell you that research is key. And it's fun. You can make it fun. I mean, you get to go interview a brain surgeon or an astronaut, you know, all for the purposes of your screenplay. And so in the case of this, I talked to some women who worked as counsellors at a, at a women's shelter in Los Angeles uh, for victims of domestic violence. And it was really interesting interviewing them and hearing about emotional abuse and how how much uh, more damaging that can be than you know it's it, it, it's it's um, something that's not often talked about. But you know it's it's I guess it's not as visceral as seeing someone with a black eye, but you can really break someone down. And one of the things I found interesting for this film was exploring the idea that someone can be manipulated so much that they start to think everything's their fault. This, it, I, this is me causing this. And uh, the people I was speaking to, they were saying that they had real trouble breaking uh, some of the women out of that spell. That this is not your fault, you know, you're not, you haven't done anything wrong, you don't deserve this. And uh, I realised I wanted to put some of that into the film. Yeah, and it really comes across really strongly. The, the, the moment, and watching Elizabeth Moss working and showing that through her sort of extraordinary range. Right, right, is, right. Is incredible. Right. Yeah. What's it like for her, you know, working right. in empty rooms and saying, okay, act against nothing, literally nothing? Um, it's intimidating. You know, there was a lot of stuff in the script that she felt was scary, but that's the reason she wants to make a film. You know, she, she wants to read a script and feel like she doesn't know how she's going to pull it off. And she told me that there was a few things in this that were like that. And it's really a one-woman show. You know, there's some great actors in the film, you know, Storm Reid, Aldous Hodge, Michael Dorman, you know, these great Australian actors like Harriet Dyer. They're all amazing performers and they do their part. But Elizabeth is in every scene. She often has these other actors as her scene partner, but she's always there. I think she had two days off the entire shoot. And so I was just always amazed at how adept she was at clicking into that traumatised mode and then stepping back out of it in one second. Which is impressive. Yeah, really, like her facility is so dialed in that she can just turn it on and off. One final question, this one actually comes from one of our fans. Uh, you, you've been involved in so many different horror sort of stories and everything. What scares you? Well, real life scares me. I, I take solace in horror movies. You know, if I want to feel comfortable and happy, I'll put on Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, if I want to be tense and upset, I'll, you know, open a, a bill. You know, like... Uh, Watch the news. Just life. Turn on the news. I mean, that is truly what's terrifying. You know, there's safety in a horror film. A horror film is like a theme park ride. You know, it's, it's, it's simulated terror. And, there, and it's great filmmaking in horror films. Um, yeah, switch over to CNN and then you'll see some true horror. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I, I find myself more and more these days having to tune out of the news and, and divert my attention to this fantasy world where you can be like, okay, I'll just live here in the world of John Carpenter for a while. It's a nice world. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's not a nice world. Yeah, it's not but a nice world. But yeah. it is. And it, it is a wonderful place to spend a couple of hours with the Invisible Man, even though he's not necessarily a nice person. No, he's not, not at all. <laughs>